When you look at the dynamic here in London and in the UK, does track and trace, first of all, work or does it not work? And that's why we've lost control. So it, it, tra track and trace is re it's really test track and trace. And it does it does two main things. The first thing is that it provides as rapidly as possible a test for people who've got symptoms. That's very, very important. That's needed at all levels of infection. Um, and it, it could be done better, but there's, you know, there's a huge amount of, of, of work on that. The second part of that is the contact tracing. Um, and I think probably at this stage, because levels of infection are, are, are kind of so high now, it is very difficult for the tracing part of track and trace to make a big impact on the epidemic. Is there another way of dealing with with this infectious disease at this point, um, going into November, other than a lockdown? So I, I don't think a lockdown is a useful term because it 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 brings everyone's minds back to March in the UK and and even to that you know the very early very stringent measures in China. I think that there are, across Europe right now, countries are considering uniform national strategies um, that they think have a better chance. Of reversing the the virus, um, and you know, with a, a variety of components in those in those measures mm. um, that are not, you know, and it doesn't amount to the same type of intervention that was that was used in March. Professor Riley, Tom Keen in New York, thank you so much for being with us. And of course, with your worldwide acclaim on how these things move across land, we're just thrilled to have you with us uh, today. In BMC Medicine, you and a team published COVID-19 in South Korea and implications for lifting stringent interventions. To cut to the chase, they got it right in your definitive study. We got it wrong. Why can't we do what they do on the Pacific Rim? That's a, that's a great question. There's, there's two sides to that. The, the things that the actual policies and the way that they implemented those policies are very good in those Pacific Rim countries. That is certainly part of it. So the speed with which testing was distributed in South Korea um, and also the, their ability to do cluster investigations was what we thought um, was the key. But that South Korea was a long time ago, and even though it looked like a large outbreak when it happened, in the global scale of things, that, that was actually now a relatively small outbreak, but they did very well. I think the pattern is so clear between, as you, you put it, kind of the, the Pacific Rim countries and, and maybe Europe and North America, we have to look at more kind of uh, deep-rooted cultural issues that, you know, are, I think we have to ask the question, I don't have the answer. I, are, are we in Europe capable of acting collectively yeah, but, but, with Professor, the same, with the same degree? I, I think this is absolutely critical. If you come out of Louis Pasteur, the fact is we conquered diphtheria. We conquered this. We conquered typhoid and on and on. Granted, it's a virus. It's not a bacterium. I get that. But the bottom line is the leadership has failed. Is it just a lack of will of politicians and leadership? I, honestly, Tom, I I don't I don't think it's just that. I think it's a I think there's an element there's a strong element of leadership, but I think it also reflects the in, the intrinsic values, the the desire, uh, the the way as I've said, the way that we are are or not capable of acting collectively. I I think that's what we have to that's really what we have to focus on. If if so, Germany right now is they've intervened earlier. They're going for a low prevalence strategy. And I think they're, you know, they're a great example in Europe to watch. How will Germany kind of achieve, you know, with lockdown light or the measures that they're using? Will they achieve a low prevalence regime going into the winter? I think, I think those are the examples that we have to look for in Europe. Right. But, uh, Professor, how many people have the virus, can transmit the virus, but are actually asymptomatic? And how do so we test those people? So um, from our study, it's somewhere probably on, on the day if we, when we randomly approach people and ask them to test them regardless of their symptom state, then of those that are positive, we get between 50 and 70% approximately um, don't show symptoms on that day. Some of those may go on to get symptoms. Um, and we, you know, the, the short answer is it's very difficult to get at those, even with, even with very high volume testing, it's hard to get at those. Um, the, the way the the testing that really works is when people have symptoms to provide them very, very rapid access and results to a test. 
And that's the, those are the highest value tests, the, the, the best that we can do those. If we get very high volumes of tests from some of the lateral flow technology that's coming online, um, then we may look, you know, we can look at large screening pro uh, programs, but they, they're, they're going to need to be run carefully. Um, and, uh, and, and, it's, and it's not immediately obvious that, that they solve the problems in one go.